Hello, I'm Gaurav Sharma from hitballseye.com and welcome to this lecture in which we shall cover the different schedules of our constitution as well as different non-constitutional bodies or statutory bodies present in India, their, their functions, their jurisdictions and other norms. Uh, first of all, let's begin with the schedules. Uh, initially, there were eight schedules uh, when the constitution came into force but with subsequent amendments, the current number is 12. So the first schedule provides the list of names of different states, their juris, their extent, as well as union territories and their extent and their boundaries. The second list provides the emoluments, allowances and privileges and so on of the President of India, the Governors, the Speakers, the Judges of Supreme Court, High Court, the CAG and so on. The third schedule deals with the oaths and affirmations of different constitutional posts. For example, the oaths taken by the union ministers, the oaths taken by the MPs, the MLAs, the CAG and so on. The fourth schedule is a very important part of the federal, uh, federal character of our constitution. It provides the allocation of states for each state in the Rajya Sabha or the Council of States, that is the higher house that uh, the number of seats is allocation this allocation is prescribed by the fourth schedule now the fifth schedule deals with the administration control of scheduled areas and scheduled tribes now the these scheduled areas and scheduled tribes are notified by the central government now further the sixth schedule also supplements or complements the other this fifth schedule Whereas it deals with the provisions of administration and control of autonomous areas in four states that is Assam, Meghalaya, Tripura and Mizoram. In Assam there are, there are four areas or four districts. There is Bodoland, there is Kirby Anglong and North Kachar Hills. This is present in Assam. In Meghalaya there are three Garo, Khasi, Jaintia tribal areas and these are all autonomous areas that is they are given certain powers to govern themselves. In Tripura, there is Tripura Tribal Hill Area Development and in Mizoram, there is Chakma Hills, Mara Hills and Lai Hills. So these are the areas which are provided certain provisions for self-governance or their own govern uh, administration. The seventh schedule provides the measure of devolution of powers. That is a division of powers, legislative powers between the union and the central level. It contains three lists, union list, state list and concurrent list. Initially there were 97 subjects but at present there are 100 subjects. In state list there were 66 subjects but as of now there are 61 and in the concurrent list there were 67 but as of now there are 52 subjects. Now what do we understand by subjects? Subjects are those uh, topics or, uh, or, or even subjects which on which the center or state can make certain laws. Now in the union lists, all the subjects that are present can only be legislated upon by the center. And similarly, in the state list, only states can make laws upon those subjects. And in concurrent list, both state as well as center can make laws. But if there is a clash between them, the central law will prevail. The eighth schedule deals with the number of scheduled languages, which is 22. Initially, there were 14 languages, but with subsequent amendments, that is uh, the, nine, the amendment of 1967, 1992 and 2003, 8 new languages were added. Therefore, the current number is 22. The ninth schedule was added by the first amendment to the Indian Constitution. Now, the important importance of uh, this ninth schedule was that all the orders and rules and acts which were added to this ninth schedule were free from the judicial review. But uh, in, in the order or the pronouncement of 2007, the Supreme Court stated that all the acts which were added to the ninth schedule 
after 1973 that is after the pronouncement of keshwananda bharti case were were subject to judicial review uh, the 10th schedule deals with anti defection law that is the disqualification of mps and mlas on account of their defection now the uh, 11th and the 12th schedule were both added to the constitution 73rd and 74th amendment respectively the 11th schedule contains 29 articles on which the panchayats can legislate or make laws and similarly the 12th schedule contains 18 subjects on which the local body government or urban local body governments for example the municipality or municipal corporation can make certain laws to uh, generate money to generate revenue so as to support certain welfare orientations and for the maintenance and development of panchayats villages or districts and districts and uh, cities right so this these are the 12 schedules and now we shall go through the uh, to st- study the different statutory and non constitutional bodies which are present in india uh, the list is for, before what used to be the planning commission has now become the niti ayog the, the main motive of niti ayog is to plan secondly there is national development council there is national human right commission then state human rights commission there is a central vigilance commission central and state information commissions and central bureau of investigations these are the major statutory bodies which are present in india and now we shall study them in detail uh, niti ayog has replaced the planning commission which was the apex body of planning they used to give st- uh, discretionary grants to the states for their development now niti ayog is the policy think tank of government of india the aim of niti ayog is to involve the states in the an economic policy making and this this step has been named as a team india that is the central government the union ministers collaborating with the state ministers so as to formulate policies which are progressive and also federal in character uh, it will provide strategic and technical advice to central and state governments that means that this niti ayog is not only full of bureaucrats but on the uh, but also of economic experts and planning experts which can uh, which can help and guide the state governments in 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 creating such form, formulating certain policies which are progressive and will go a long way in ensuring the welfare of the citizens of india and the states the prime minister is the ex official chairperson of niti ayog further the composition of niti ayog is it is headed by the prime minister of course then the governing councils includes cms chief ministers of the states as well as lieutenant governors of the union territories the regional councils for specific issues and tenures that is limited to the certain mem- the, the membership of these regional councils is limited to the number of states or uts present in a specific region now it as i've told that it can consists also consists of experts specialists and practitioners with the relevant domain knowledge for example economic uh, pe- economic experts as well as planning experts uh, it's a full time organization framework now to complement the work which has been done by the niti ayog the creation of five year plans and devolution of uh, resources or or discretionary grants to the states something called the national development council has been made now the composition of ndc is prime minister all union cabinet ministers chief ministers of all the states G- cms and administrative of all union territories now the main functions of an ndc is to prepare a guideline for the preparation of a national plan by the planning commission slash niti ayog so these will these will be uh promoting a sort of a federal character federal motive in which the states will actively be uh, taking part in the policy formulation now the main function is to consider the plan which is prepared by the niti ayog that is if a plan has been made the ndc will share or comment or deliberate upon the five year plan that has been made by the niti ayog or the planning commission uh now as of now the 12th five year plan is in motion which will last till 2017 and then later on uh, niti ayog will formulate another five year plan which shall be 
deliberated and discussed by the NDC uh, to view, review the working of a national plan from time to time. As the time passes, this NDC will pursue the uh, the effect till which to which the national plan has been uh, has been successful. Now another very important non-constitutional or the statutory body is National Human Rights Commission. Now this body was formulated under the Protection of Human Rights Act 1993. Now it composes of a multi member it's a multi member body consisting of a chairperson and four members. One plus four. Now the chairman is always a retired Chief Justice of India and four serving members in which two shall be a retired judge of a Supreme Court and second a serving or a retired Chief Justice of a High Court and two people with knowledge and practice practical experience with respect to human rights. Right. So this is a quasi judicial body. National Human Rights Commission the, the appointments to the National NHRC are done by the President on the recommendations of a six member body. Now this six member body or a committee is consists of Prime Minister, the Speaker of Lok Sabha, the Deputy Chairperson of Rajya Sabha, leaders of opposition of both the houses and the Union Home Minister. So these six member committee decides who shall be the CGI and four other members of the National Human Rights Commission. The present uh, and the present National Human Rights Commission chairperson is Mr. H.L. Dattu. Now, the term of NHRC is five years or till they attain an age of 70 years. Now, the main functions of an NHRC is to inquire into any violations of human rights. So, if there is any violation, this is the body which shall strive into the inquire into such uh, cases. It visits the jails and detention places to study living conditions of inmates, to review constitutional and other legal safeguards for protection of human rights, and of course to encourage NGOs working in the field of human rights. Another important function is to study the treaties and other international instruments on human rights and make recommendations for their effective implementation in India. Now, uh, as at the national level, there is National Human Rights Commission. At the state level, there are State Human Rights Commission. The, it's a, a, again a statutory body which was formed under this act, the Protection of Human Rights Act 1993. The term is five years or till the age of 70 years. The composition, uh, it's again a multi-member body that consists of a chairperson and two members. One plus two. Uh, now the first, at the state level, there sh he shall be a state chief justice of a high court of any state and the two members shall be a retired or serving high court judge or a district court with seven years experience and secondly a person with knowledge or practical experience with respect to human rights. So these are the three members. Now functions of a state Human Rights Commission is similar to those of national but at a state level. Now another very important uh, statutory body is Central Vigilance Commission. It has been made a statutory body with, from, with effect from 2003. It composes of a multi-member body consists of a CVC plus two Vigilance Commissioners. They are appointed by the President on recommendation of a committee which consists of the Prime Minister, Home Minister and the Leader of Opposition. At present, the Chief Vigilance Commission is Sri K. V. Chaudhary. The term of the members is 4 years or till the age of 65 years. Uh, the functions of this committee are to inquire cases of corruption by public servants under the Prevention of Corruption Act 1988 to tender advice to the central government and its authorities. So this Central Vigilance Commission is primarily to deal with the corruption cases and to create a sense of accountability and responsibility for the public offices. Under the Right to Information Act of 2005, another statutory body was established that is the Central Information Commission or the CIC. The composition of this body is one chairperson and ten other members. The CIC is appointed by the President on recommendation of a committee which composes of the Prime Minister, the Leader of Opposition and another Union Cabinet Minister nominated by the Prime Minister. 
So this three member body decides who shall be the inf uh, central information commissioner at different members. As of now, the CIC is Radha Krishna Mathur. The tenure consists of uh, the tenure is five years or till they attain an age of 65 years. The different functions of a CIC are to ensure delivery of relevant information to general public. That is, they uh, provide a lot of transparency. Like right to information is an, is an empowering act which provides empowerment through knowledge dissemination. So CIC ensures that the right, this right to knowledge of citizens is totally ensured. CIC states, CIC has all the power of a civil court. They also try to ensure the proper implementation of all the provisions of Right to Information Act. Now, as uh, there are uh, there are Central Information Commissioners, there are state also state CICs for different states. Now, also to tackle the corruption cases, there is something called the CBI, a Central Bureau of Investigation. It was established in 1941 as a special police establishment which was tasked with domestic security. Uh, it was renamed as Central Bureau of Investigation on April 1963 and its motto is Industry, Impartiality and Integrity. The director of a CBI is appointed by a committee which consists of Prime Minister, Leader of Opposition and Chief Justice of India or a Judge of a Supreme Court. The legal powers of investigation of CBI are derived from the Delhi Special Police Establishment Act of 1946 or known as DSPE Act of 1946. Uh, the different functions of CBI are to investigate cases in which offenses against central government employees and employees of central PSUs, central public se uh, sector undertakings and central banks. It also investigate cases involving financial interest of central government, breaches of central laws enforced by the government of India and also major fraud and embezzlement cases like multi-organized crime. Uh, this CBI can also investigate cases which are provided or asked by other case, uh, other states. The states can also ask the center to have a CBI investigation. Also, it investigates cases which involve multi-agency or are of international nature. Now, let's just quickly go through the questions which were asked previously. Which of the following function is not one of the official languages in the 8th schedule? There are 22 languages in which Sanskrit, Nepali, Kashmiri is a language. Persian is not a part of 8th schedule. Which schedule of the Indian constitution has a list of 29 states and 7 union territories? That would be the first schedule. The third schedule is oaths. The fourth is uh, the number of allocation of seats in Rajya Sabha to the states. The fifth schedule is the provisions to the administration of the, state, the scheduled states and tribes. The chairperson and the member of National Human Rights Commission are appointed by on the recommendations of committee consistency. We have just recently done that. There is a six-member body which consists of Prime Minister, Home Minister, Leader of Opposition of both houses, yes, Speaker of Lok Sabha plus the Deputy Chairperson of so this is the correct answer. So this brings us to this at the end of this lecture. In this lecture, we have studied all the different schedules which are present in our constitution, as well as different statutory and non-constitutional bodies which function in the government to ensure the proper implementation of different laws like the right to information or uh, or to investigate cases of corruption like Chief Vigilance Commission or CBI. Uh, in the future lectures, we shall also share some light on other aspects. Till then, good luck, work hard and hit the bullseye. Thank you.